Hare Krishna. Welcome. Hare Krishna. Thank you so much. So today, I think we will continue and hopefully conclude our discussion on mythology. And okay. uh, till now, if we had a, like a diagram, we have discussed the ethical aspects, how ethical lessons can be drawn through the ladder of abstraction. Then we discussed about the historical aspects, how the historicity has been established, at least of some aspects, through Dwarka findings and things like that. Then we discussed about the metaphorical aspect, how the non-literal understandings are okay as long as they supplement, but they don't sub supplant the historical understand, the literal understanding. Then also we discussed to some extent the idea that these are stories for enter they are also entertaining stories with drama and action and all these can help uh, attract attention yes. so today i think we'll discuss two more aspects one is the mm, the supernatural aspects within it and finally we'll discuss the enlightenment aspect how right. these are also sources of enlightenment now <clears throat> by supernatural there are uh, there this is related with entertainment that there are some people who say that in the past uh, people were gullible they did not know scientific uh, scientific laws and that's why whenever any stories were made up they believed it easily mm -hmm. so now we should be able to differentiate between what is made up in the story what is, and what is actually real or also that these are made up stories. So now there are two aspects. One is some people say that some part of the stories are made up and some people say the whole stories are made, all this, the whole entire story is made up. But either way, they often use the, the miraculous aspects of these stories to disprove their historicity. So one way to establish the historicity is by finding fossils and by artifacts and things like that. But they don't, that doesn't address the fact that these stories contain a lot of supernatural things. So now the word supernatural itself has a lot of, uh, a lot of connotations. But here we will simply use it to refer to that which is not understandable by the modern laws of science, by the laws of physics. Now from our perspective, many of these phenomena are not supernatural because say, because they are still within material nature. But they are just not within nature as under, material nature as understood through physics. Just a so, small query. Do we also accept that uh, even modern physics, so to say, is also in a flux? It also has great minds trying to say that, okay, this was pre-Newtonian and uh, this is how we understood things two centuries ago. But now we are having some people who also have established that, okay, this was seen as a particle, now it is seen as a wave. Okay, mm -hmm. this was seen as something, now it is seen as something else. So uh, you have, I mean, just for a layman, That's can true, you yeah. shed some light on that? Yeah, it's a very good point. In fact, uh, quantum uncertainty and the de way to deal with the quantum uncertainty through multiple universes has allowed what some some skeptics or atheists call as a, a backdoor entry for spirituality. <laughs> <laughs> so basically these are very technical concepts, but briefly. No, but just, just to say, this is how they feel. This is how much they feel that in the hard structured Cartesian logical world of physics, they are just wary that, you know, some of us, some, some of the weaker minds among the physicists, they yeah. might allow some, some spirituality to some lurk in and do its mischief. <laughs> just a thought. <laughs> That's true. In fact, uh, there are, and mm, basically what the, the Newtonian physics, it's like physics and biology, if you consider, physics is considered the most fundamental of all sciences. Because it all deals right. with literal physical objects, and they exist tangibly. And then their interactions are chemistry and interactions which involve living organisms and biology. So what has happened is 
that physics has increasingly moved toward in toward incorporating consciousness means from mechanistic toward non mechanistic okay but biology has tried to move increasingly from conscious to mechanistic okay so they the two are moving in opposite directions <laughs> biology does deal with conscious beings but the increased almost uh, rabid you could say attempt among uh, biologists especially evolutionary biologists is to try to explain everything including consciousness in physical terms on the other hand physics itself to be explain itself uh, consciousness is being incorporated so you know this could also uh, spiritual trends within science could also be a future topic for us to discuss actually oh yeah <laughs> so but you know it so happens that some of our topics get incubated and generated within the conversation itself yeah that's <laughs> true <laughs> so just to recap yeah, so coming back to our track no just but but this could also relate with us that, so quantum i have seen at least two three devotees as well as several christian scholars talk about how quantum physics talks about multiple universes and multiple levels of reality just like you perceive things from one perspective it's the it's a wave another perspective you perceive it's particle so like that within mainstream science itself multiple modes of perceiving could lead to multiple perceptions of reality that is that is has been a more or less at least a acceptable fact it's not a widely accepted thesis but that is some way uh, we could also talk about some spiritual perceptions with which are given in our script, in our tradition also but coming back to your point that uh, there is an aspect within the within the leela within the past times which are which seem to be not acceptable to the logical mind so i will give an example and i'll give an explanation so what i'll be doing i'll give ex- example then the criticism of the explanation the de- criticism of the example and then the defense for the example and you can add as you like we can take it for that example yeah. also sure. say for example let's look at the govardhan leela now when krishna lifts up a hill as is described in the story a significantly large hill then people the logical attitude is how can anyone lift up a hill like this and oh people at that time didn't know about the law of gravity and that's why when some stories like this were made up people just believed those stories but now we need to evaluate the stories with critical intelligence so there are several issues with it first is that did the people in the past lack critical intelligence because when krishna lifted up the govardhan hill even the vrajavasis who saw it first hand still they had their doubts and they, they <laughs> saw it but then they ask they ask go and ask nanda maharaj how did he do it so it is not that they were gullible and they were ready to believe anything but then they were open for some other kind of explanation and what was that explanation when krishna when nanda maharaj said that actually he is narayan or he is as good as narayan because he is blessed in a particular way and then that's what that's what the uh, the sage gargamuni at his birth has told us so then that oh okay if he is narayan then he can do such things if he is a supreme being so the point is that they were that they also knew how nature works but that there might there are some forces there are some beings higher than nature who can adjust the workings of nature they were open to that explanation one of the dogmas of modern science is the universality and the in inescapability of the laws of nature that the laws of nature have to work everywhere at all times in just the same way they are working on the earth so of course the law of gravity works everywhere the specific volume may vary for example the constant g varies on the earth that's why moving on the moon they hop over there yeah exactly but the but the principle of gravity is universal the specific force of gravity will vary but this is uh, okay we agree with this law but we also understand that this law is working 
under some higher guidance so now within mainstream physics where the laws of nature come from is something which has never been clearly explained so there are broadly three theories about it one is the laws just exist along with matter from the primordial state of the universe so the laws are innate properties of matter the second is that the laws are emergent properties and different laws may emerge in different universes and in our universe the laws that are suitable for life to eventually emerge have come about and the third is which is strongly reviled by mainstream mainstream uh, many mainstream scientists who are atheistic is that these laws signify a divine intelligence okay. so now but the point is that why should the laws exist at all if originally things became then the singularity the singularity itself did not have any specialized characteristics then how did laws of mathematical precision emerge from it so that's a perplexity so at least one explanation is there that these laws reflect a higher intelligence and this is not exactly the design argument because the design argument says that specific forms are a manifestation of divine intelligence here we're not talking about the specific forms we're talking about just the principles that govern the universe in terms of the laws so the idea is if there is a god who is in charge of the laws maya dakshina prakriti as krishna says so then krishna uh, can suspend the laws of nature when he wants so law of gravity normally works but he can suspend it when he wants and krishna doesn't need to for example say if i have to lift up this tablet now i if i have to lift it on one finger i'll have to find the exact center of gravity and balance it over there so krishna doesn't need to find a center of gravity because he he is the source of gravity and he can suspend gravity whenever he wants so the idea is that miracles or the supernatural events within scriptures the miracles are not against science they are above science mm. so against science means that we we naively believe there are no laws of nature but we fully accept that there are laws of nature but also as suyate sa characharam hetu nane na konte jagat viparivartate that by its law things change in this world so krishna acknowledges there is a material nature and it has its own laws but then he says i supervise them so this is how there is a philosophical explanation for the miraculous events within scripture so what we call as miracles or what we call as supernatural or miraculous there is a explanation from a we could say a, a rationality that includes a divinity so we have a explanation it is not entirely irrational but it, if if we reject the divine idea of a, a overarching divinity then this seems irrational Mm, so that's one aspect to it any thoughts on this uh these are just some personal feelings uh, when for the first time i heard this explanation from the proper in his class and also in a read in a purport that uh, law uh, a law maker precedes the existence of a law it's the law maker who states that this has to be like that and that is a general uh i'm talking from a layman's point of view that is general experience throughout world history and uh, now this is like a really banal daily life occurrence there is a road like say in india you say keep left so we need to go somewhere keep left and go ahead and the coming traffic is in the opposite direction it takes your right side is where the cars are coming towards you and you are keeping left and the municipality or the rto the road traffic organization here says that for the next 3 days this road is no entry because we are doing something here or we for some reason and everybody follows it so i it may be naive to make this on a huge cosmic scale but here is a existing law that you can use this road then i am introduced to the law making authority who comes and tells me that from today you cannot use it for the next 3 days 
and hopefully there is a good reason so they are they are they have the power to make the law they have the power to suspend the law and after 3 days i find again i am supposed to follow the old rule so law making is like elastic the law making authority is rigid whenever they want to suspend something they want to start something so therefore uh, what proper explains is stones are normally supposed to sink but in the presence of ram and if you don't as- accept ram's divinity that's a different thing but if you read the ramayan where it is emphasized advertised you are exhorted to you are encouraged to accept it then in the presence of the law giver if the vanaras are writing ram and have this faith that this stone will float so the to- stone doesn't float because suddenly the physics have changed there is a reason behind it the authority behind the previous law that stones have to sink is now saying that they should not sink yeah so even at a minute level in human society like the in the times of war if the the home or the field is right near the border with the enemy country the military may come and say in the name of the law with the war act or whatever the powers given by the emergency act of so and so you are not supposed to stay in your own home you may say but then i pay the rent and everything no but now it's an emergency you're all being evacuated and uh, mm-hmm. this home will be used by the military every country has this law by the way you might think that uh, you are staying in your home your land or whatever but the government by one stroke of a pen can change everything so within human society we see that uh, if if human society is seen as a microcosm of the cosmic reality principles are the same law making authority makes enacts laws when somebody opposes them enforces them and keeps them elastic enough that they can change them so i think uh, nothing more is happening even in ramayana and mahabharat mm. just a way of looking at things so it ultimately boils down to a choice of how we see the laws of nature yes. if we see the laws of nature as in self as as independent realities which actually doesn't have a rational explanation why should the laws exist as independent realities normally yeah, there is a law which says you cannot go beyond 70 miles who made it nobody knows who enacts it nobody knows if somebody doesn't follow it nothing happens if you follow it nothing happens and there is no historical beginning of it this is strange this is more strange than feeling that there is a divinity who is uh, assuming yeah. something has to be there yeah correct that's true so now within the question within the aspects of scripture that 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 uh, what shall what is the word that agitate or provoke the rational mind i think there are different categories one is which we explain as the direct actions of divinity mm. so i would like to make this as four or five categories okay. and then uh, we could discuss them see another is say for example there are many many scholars of the ramayana who say the ramayana is a perfectly rational tale till it comes to the kishkinda kanda and okay. from there it becomes like a children's fable with all <laughs> kinds of animals talking <laughs> <laughs> till then it's human beings and human beings talk but animals don't and we have first uh, first monkeys talking and then we have bear bears talking and then we have vultures talking so it just becomes too actually it becomes even before the kishkin in the arena kand itself it happens but that it's almost like filled with animals talking so that's one category hmm? um so now another i'll just mention the categories and then we can discuss one of them the other yeah, is sure so it is so beings acting in way is which no it is could say ordinary beings other beings apart from god acting in particular ways that's one aspect then another aspect is beings having powers that normally human beings don't have say for example 
uh, mystic powers that certain beings have hmm? shape shifting flying in the sky becoming invisible or whatever that's another aspect and another aspect is that there are there are simply that dimensions are unbelievable say for example there's a mountain which is a several several miles large or there is uh, there are time spans and physical things which are huge hmm? so we look at these three things that means the abilities of beings and the uh, dimensions of script, dimensions of things hmm? so first uh, with respect to the the talking monkeys see the ramayana is quite clear that there are certain be that the vanaras themselves are not ordinary beings in fact the word vanara means or, or wise or nara is human mm-hmm. or human when people see them oh are these human beings who are they so that me so it is described that these are celestial apes so the understanding is that there are different beings in the universe and some beings have the power to talk because although they may resemble they resemble certain beings on the earth but they may not be those beings exactly another point could be that also sometimes some highly higher evolved beings take birth on the earth and when they take birth on the earth they may have higher powers so the one many of the one are actually celestial beings sugriva is the son of son of surya yeah surya yeah vali was the son of indra and beyond that also some other cases when a being is able to talk that is because they were already evolved in a previous life spiritually like gajendra when he talks and he composes sanskrit prayers that is because he is already a evolved soul in a previous life and some abilities especially those connected with spiritual reality can be carried from a previous life to a next life and sometimes if some beings are able to do some things extraordinary that might be again directly divine intervention so for example lord chaitanya made the animals dance and sing the hari krishna mantra as it is said now this is the direct action of divinity so that means again the point is it's not that all animals are expected to talk in in the ramayana and the mahabharat there are also descriptions when say, sita is lost and uh, when sita is being stolen first sita calls out to the animals please tell ram please help and ram asks the birds and the animals now none of the birds and the animals their reply and speak in a human speech so it's not that any and every cre- natural creature is attributed speaking ability over there so it's not indiscriminate so in that sense we have a particular box of rationality but beyond that there are other things which are also included in rationality so that's that's the explanation for these kind of uh, beings having some special abilities any thoughts on this no you covered almost everything okay now with respect to supernatural powers say for example uh <clears throat> somebody can you know get that there are there is a whole genre of supernatural power they let the teleportation somebody just closes their eyes and goes find themselves at some other place somebody has clairvoyance they can look into some other people's abilities uh, they can they can see something invisible and know what is going on now these are all described as abilities at the level of the mind so now with respect to hanuman's jumping across to lanka now it's not technically uh, how does he do it it is it is a combination of physical prowess complemented with divine grace because you now the various monkeys ask and they say you know i can i can jump this far i can jump this far but i can't jump this far so it's a matter of physical prowess but hanuman is able to jump much more because he is he has got extraordinary physical prowess by god's grace but there's a whole genre of mystic powers and in fact devamrit maharaj has written a whole book called searching for vedic india where he tries to give a lot of rational explanations for various mystic powers so when there is an encounter with beings for example who can say ravana changes his form 
or marija changes his form so how are such things possible now we don't have any empirical evidence for somebody being able to change their form but something in that direction that people do have powers you know that there is say for example if somebody has a spoon and there are there are ways in which you can just by the thought of your mind, by by your thoughts can actually get the spoon to bend now, most of this is hoax but there are some cases which have actually been done with respect to the so basically the basic principle is without going into specifics is that the mind has powers of its own and the mind can act on matter in ways that are not explainable by the laws of physics yeah and uh, probably the most uh, evident uh, or the most uh, well established evidence for this is random number generators and their study at princeton university basically a random number generator would generate a number between 0 to 9 with a probability of 1 by 10, 1 out of 10 but if there is somebody who stands near that random number generator and says let 6 come let 6 comes let 6 come now it's not that every time 6 will come but the okay. but the statistical results indicated significant increase in the number 6 if you increase if you do this probability if you do this experiment at a very high speed over large numbers so if you do thousands or thousands of trials thousands and th- thousands and thousands of trials then the pro- the number 6 comes much more than other times and interestingly this happens it doesn't depend on physical distance so the person desiring that the random number generator should give 6 can be in london and this can be in princeton oh really but still it happens and not only that they find that the person can desire this on monday and they do the experiment on friday and still it happens so this is not conclusive evidence but it is at least indicative that maybe the universe is what is that saying in uh, shakespeare othello i think there are more things in the world than what your philosophy can comprehend there are more wonders in this world ratio than thou can comprehend of <laughs> okay here is your yeah <laughs> so so that at least there can be openness to that and then the <clears throat> then comes the part of huge dimensions so for example in the bhagavatam there is description of himalayan mountains as being far far bigger than what we know them to be so how is this to be understood so this is where the quantum physics with different ways of perceiving comes up that the same reality is perceived at different levels in different ways so so when scripture describes a particular reality one 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 of my favorite examples for explaining this is a uh, a computer with multiple levels of access if i have a basic user access then if i search all files in the laptop i might see that you have 6000 files over here but somebody who has administrative access they search all files and they may found that there are actually the 11000 files over there oh yeah but the 5000 files are not accessible to me because i don't have that level of access so in the vedic tradition there is this whole concept of gyana is always associated with adhikar now how much knowledge you have depends on how much authority you have to access that knowledge your authority means in terms of qualification so reality is multi level and certain certain cosmological aspects such as landmarks like the earth or whatever they can have multiple levels of uh perception and different people perceive it differently based on the level of their karmic qualifications just to so add something to... in today's uh, world there could be say intel like we are born both been to intel in phoenix arizona so a concierge like a front office receptionist could be allowed only in the front office area cafeteria and washroom a janitor may be allowed in say few more areas a scientist may be allowed in almost all areas and few key people may be the top boss of that particular area their card could open them access to each and every nook and cranny of the entire 
so 5000 uh, strong uh, base there so right from the top person to the front office receptionist the commonality is that they are all employees they are all part of the system but if you tell them describe what this facility is obviously somebody who has access to only 10% of the area we will say that this is what i know about this thing and he is not telling the lie but he is simply inadequate that's beautiful i think it's a much more accessible example than computer files this is also about <laughs> physical terrains yeah that's good and so that's that's broadly how some questionable uh, dimensions and figures can be explained now there is also i think we discussed about chitraketu and his 10 million wives isn't it we discussed in the first session we didn't we didn't not yet didn't, okay now there is also one more possibility we could say that these are these are traditional literature they are poetry they are poem poems and in poems in the, there is a possibility for uh, for rhetorical emphasis through exaggeration so it is not that everything which is contrary to our understanding is to be considered exaggerated but there is a possibility that certain dimensions they are given for the purpose of emphasizing some things uh, for for the purpose of say conveying a particular reality where where the emphasis is not on the literal reality so for example if someone there is a description that chitraketu had 10 million wives so now you say how is this practically possible now one explanation mm -hmm. could be that if it is given in scripture it is possible maybe at those that time beings had more prowess but somebody may say logically now how was he even able to associate with so many uh, wives so now if some some people might just say this is what is given in scripture we accept it but there is no indication in that particular story that uh, chitraketu himself had some supernatural powers no he he couldn't even have a son although he tried to have one with so many wives so then another explanation could be that the main lesson of the story is that no matter how much arrangements we make for material enjoyment if certain things are not destined they will not come and if we Uh, if we or the gate crash ourselves to get that happiness that happiness will come with corresponding distress so we can't get more than what we are ordained that is the main lesson of this past time and that's what happened when he gets a son and the son is poisoned in his early infancy so the point is if that is the main lesson that become detached from don't be infatuated by certain worldly pleasures thinking that they will give you happiness then the specific number of how many wives he has doesn't matter for that lesson and there is a purport on prabhupad says that chitraketu had hundreds of thousands of wives uh, he, sorry see here chitraketu has hundreds and thousands of wives he says now hundreds and thousands is a generic figure it like there are hundreds and thousands of people he, if he wanted to say specifically he could have said there are hundreds of thousands 100 into 1000 but he doesn't say that so the point is that in some cases if somebody finds certain literal numbers very difficult to accept then that needn't be seen as a as a block for assimilating the essential lesson so yes in fact chetan charitamrit also say that one place that chetan mahaprabhu says that the great poets have glorified krishna using various alankaras using yes. various Uh, various uh, rhetorical devices or figures of speech and there he says one is metaphors and the other is atishoyakti atishoyakti is hyperboles uh, so exaggerations so there could be some aspects which are rhetorical expressions of greatness now some now some people may say this is god's inconceivable ability and he can do anything well there is no god directly involved in the past times of chitraketu so Now, it could be that somehow god god acted over there the divine supreme acted over there but it could be that there is a uh, there is a possibility this could be a explanation 
this could just be a poetic point so everything now we are not saying that everything is a poetic exaggeration we can't dismiss away a lot of scripture in that but there is a possibility that can also be taken into account any thought in this mm, no i i i also have read that in the chaitanya mrit where poets do take uh, what's it called poetic license poetic to, license yeah to describe something so yeah so this is one way where we can sort of adjust at least uh, mentally these descriptions of huge mountains or the fantastic number of wives somebody has and not go into the nitty-gritty of okay then uh, how the palaces were constructed and how did he know their names or uh, so on and so forth yeah continue in fact bhaktivinoda thakur take this approach to many aspects of the bhagavatam he has written a book called the krishna samhita and it was a controversial book at his times i don't think we have discussed this also until now krishna samhita the, the book has been mentioned yeah and but his the three levels of explanation no not talks so about, much or talks about how uh, basically he was living at a time when what was bengal renaissance was going on and there was a lot of skepticism about the books of in book about books within our tradition especially the mythological aspect the supernatural aspect so one way he navigated it was by saying that yes there is a literal understanding and beyond that so he re- redefines the words kanishta madhyama and uttama so those who stick to literal understanding he says they are kanishta and there are madhyama who look for some kind of rational or universal understanding in it and from their perspective he he talks about two aspects of the bhagavatam the cosmology and the chronology that means the at that time the idea that kali yuga is so long and satyuga is so long and this is so long that seemed unbelievable to many people that the cosmic ages could go on for so long because at that time still the long how how old the earth has been that was also a matter of debate so he tried to give, he gave some rationalist explanation for that saying that okay this could be you know these figures somebody might not take them literally similarly the some of the descriptions of the bhagavatam in the fifth canto he said that essential for example the descriptions of hell so he has made the point that the essential principle is that we are accountable for our actions the specifics of how which action how we are accountable for that can vary from person to person and he says that they, these could be poetic creations now bhakti thakur doesn't repeat that understanding in any of his other books and my understanding is that he is not questioning whether the bhagavatam is right or not in giving these descriptions but he is not uh, he is not what he is doing is he is creating space for people who can't accept these aspects of the bhagavatam to still to proceed towards the essential message of the bhagavatam which is the message of mm-hmm. bhakti and of transcendental love so there are we need to see that that the what is contextual to the bhagavatam or uh, what is not central to the core message of the bhagavatam doesn't obstruct people from getting to its central message and prabhupada also has this approach on several occasions so for example prabhupad when he was asked that there are some descriptions of how maharaj ugrasen had a large number of bodyguards yeah. and some devotees asked prabhupad you know when we talk with the scholars that he had that ugrasen had a large number of bodyguards so how they start laughing how is it possible dwarka is such a small place how can so many so many people live over there so then prabhupad could have said that you know, for god anything is possible but prabhupad did not take that approach he said that among all the sections in the bhagavatam was the only thing you found to speak with the scholars correct so that means that his focus and his focus was on what is most important you you present that and if something is less important and that is obstructing us then obstructing some people from coming to krishna then we don't have to make that as a core test of faith so here i try to uh, see a look at the principle of anukulyasya sankalpa pratikulyasya varjanam except what is favorable and avoid that is unfavorable 
so what is favorable that the favorable thing is that people understand about krishna and become attracted to krishna and raise their consciousness what is unfavorable at some aspects of the bhagavatam which are difficult to understand if they are unfavorable then keep them at distance we don't reject them but it is you know in when when people hear fiction or watch fiction it is said that there is something called suspension of disbelief yeah hmm so there could be i don't necessarily accept it i don't necessarily reject it but i i suspend my skeptical side over here and i look for what is the essential point so we that there's something that like that also could be done and the, and in some ways prabhupad also recommends this approach twice in the bhagavatam as far as i have seen one is in the first canto where he says when krishna comes from dwarka hastinapur to dwarka and the path is given by which he comes and pro and the purports there was some geologists try to find out exact path which krishna took and so that is quite difficult because the surface of the earth keeps changing as far as we are concerned we are happy that krishna has reached the destination krishna has reached dwarka and is going to perform past times over there so that's one example any thoughts on this no that was, i also had uh, read the same paragraph yeah and uh, remember that and another is even more core when prabhupada talks about the rasleela and he says that if you read the rasleela the purpose of the rasleela is that we become free from sensual desire that's the falashruti with the rasleela gives but if that doesn't happen to you then prabhupada says don't read it don't read it right now so that means we have to look at the purpose of raising our consciousness and see if reading a particular section is helping us or not if not then we can keep it as they say keep it in the ball park car park a ball park yeah. just keep keep it uh, park for some time and move onward so that's the we could say the miraculous aspect to it now this took a lot of time un- unexpectedly so we have now the entertainment aspect and the enlightenment aspect should we just quickly complete it or should we take it to another session we'll take another session because this is more detail we have even those of our listeners can also understand where exactly we are and what point we are trying to drive Yes. So, any generic thoughts on what we discussed till now? No, we can just uh, have a quick capitulation. We'll take the, the next two parts in the next discussion. Okay. So, uh, if we discuss a six part of study of mythology, the ethical, there is the uh, historical, then there is the metaphorical, which we are discussing. Can we have a visual next time before we begin? Can we have a visual yeah, of the that. six? I'll do that. I'll do that. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. then there is the so today what we discuss was the miraculous or the supernatural and uh, then next time we'll discuss the entertaining and the enlightening aspect of it so now within the miraculous we discussed uh, broadly the miracles which god has performed directly they are that those are miracles are not against science they are above science because there is the laws of nature which are violated by miracles Uh, how do they where do the laws of nature themselves come from so we could say a more rational explanation is that the laws of nature come from a lawmaker and that lawmaker could suspend it temporarily and beyond that so that is directly what god does then we discussed about how some beings seem to have abilities which ordinary be which beings in our experience don't have so we discussed that could be from a previous life that could be the beings are coming from a higher level of reality or those beings may have uh, got some some powers which are mystic powers now the essence of mystic powers is see science isn't just study material reality it actually studies only physical reality within the material reality only so whereas we understand there is a mind also and the mind can exert influences over matter in a way that the laws of physics may not be able to explain and with respect to that i discussed about the the some experiment random number generate another experiments and then we talked about the <clears throat> dimensions of physical objects or of the universal dimensions so physical objects if they have very big dimensions then it could be because we are perceiving them in a different way there could be multiple levels of access is like to a computer or to a high security building so the cosmos can also have multiple levels of access therefore what we perceive and what others perceive can be different 
and then and I last we conclude by discussing on Bhakti Thakur's approach to the chronology and the cosmology of the Bhagavatam. He said that there's a literal, there's a rational, but then there is a transcendental. The transcendental part we'll discuss later, but in the next session. But the rational aspect is that okay, if this seems too difficult, then don't obsess over it. The important thing is that you move move ahead beyond these descriptions to the essential message of the Bhagavatam. So the essential message is that we learn, we become attracted to Krishna and we develop, raise our consciousness. So if certain details are obstructing us in that, then we can temporarily put them aside, suspend disbelief and move toward the core message. Okay. So yeah, just one last point that uh, this thing of access, if we uh, go deeper into this model of how somebody is uh, allowed or denied access, when we bring the three modes into question, then it becomes a very rigid kind of a thing that somebody fit uh, predominance of the mode of ignorance will certainly not be allowed in certain sections of the cosmos. That's somebody true. with passion will not be allowed. And somebody with predominantly in the mode of goodness will only be allowed. So here, there is no question of belief or disbelief. Either you are in or you are not allowed in. And why you're not allowed in? Because of your choice of getting, uh, clinging to one particular mode combination. So here, that is another aspect. Yeah, where... I, I think let's discuss about this in enlightening aspect. We'll discuss about the modes. Yeah, There's a lot okay. that could be said about how one's consciousness uh, shapes one's perception. Yeah, and correct. We could discuss that. Thank you for that comment. Thank you. Like Thank for you. example, the, yeah, the sure. last thing today, the United States government. If somebody has associated with a particular group, which the government feels is uh, dangerous for homeland security, if you have visited a certain country, which they feel that you should not be doing that, and they say, we have the right to not allow you. And even if you have a visa, even if you land at an airport, they might send you back. So access given, access denied is now such a part of our daily news. And it has been exercised by governments. So that's true. That's if, a very good example. Yeah. And something which is relevant for all of us. Because <laughs> immigration <laughs> can be an anxiety for everyone. <laughs> so even if you visit a social media site, that will depend upon you being allowed to enter a country or not. Because we come to that level now. That's true. Yeah, every even newspapers have that members members only area. You now you can exactly. read some articles free, but some articles you can't read free. Yeah. Uh, it's a good point. Yeah, so access is a universal concept. Yes. So thank you okay. very much. Thank you, Harakishtha.